Hi, I'm Mark Worsley and welcome to another edition of the Post-Match Show. In a week that has been quite crucial for our English clubs in the Champions League, for one particular Portuguese, well, his Blues haven't gone away despite his side's midweek win. Now, if there's anything that's going to complement this uneven moustache that I've grown for November, will be this young man here, Alex Zawoski, who's going to give us his expert analysis on this week's football. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Expert analysis, not so sure. <laughs> well, Alex, welcome no, nevertheless to the show. And of course, you'll be here bec- you're only here because of you, your knowledge about football better than mine. <laughs> but let's start. Um, but before I start, actually, with the Champions League, I do have to ask you the question has to be big. Where's your moustache? Mark, 20,000 of my members could go past, and I still wouldn't be able to <laughs> force one as good as that. Dear Lord, I don't know much about that as being as good as that. But listen, let's, let's get straight to the football end. Let's look at the Champions League this week yep. and um, everything that's happened this week. Um, Manchester City were in action. They won by three goals to one away against Sevilla at a very difficult venue at the Ramon Sanchez Piz 1. What did you make of that result, Alex? It's an excellent result for Man City and Manuel Pellegrini. Um, they've struggled to get out of the qualifying, ca- well, the qualifying campaigns, um, sorry, the group stages there for the last couple of seasons. Although now they can put all their eggs into one basket up until February and the last 16 round comes knocking. I mean, it was a fantastic win for City away from home. Sterling once again on on the score sheet, fifty million pound. He's proving all. He's proving his worth. Proving his worth slowly but surely, Mark. It will take him a few seasons, producing a real top quality level to justify that kind of price tag for such a young man who, in relative terms, hasn't achieved an awful lot in the game. But as you mentioned, now slowly but surely, he scored a hat trick against Bournemouth. Mm. He's slowly beginning to justify part well parts of the price tag anyway. Something against Bournemouth. Though, isn't it? <laughs> and listen, a hat trick is a hat trick, nevertheless. And uh, let's switch over to the red side of Manchester, where their goal run ended thanks to their captain Wayne Rooney, who scored the only goal in the one 0 victory against CSK in Moscow. It was it was an important win for United. Um, however, now Rooney's obviously breaking United's goal scoring duck, which is being picked up upon by everybody, uh, not least the fans. Now, for me, Louis Van Gaal needs to make sure that he's getting the style of swagger and panache that United fans have become accustomed to. And this, you know, the tutelage of Ferguson for 20 odd years now. You have to give Van Gaal credit where it's due, and um, he, he's, he's very brave when he comes out in the press and he takes the rap for all of his players. He does, Mark, but he's not alone in doing that. They're, you know, all of the top level managers do it, all of the elite managers do that. Um, Arsene Wenger tends to do it, Jose Mourinho does it more than most, mm. um, deflecting blame off the players. What is about what is it about Van Gaal and the way he speaks in front of the press? It just commands respect. I don't know why. He engages everyone when he's speaking. He engages a lot of people, but he also irks a lot of people. He's not the most given to the media. Um, you don't you don't tend to get an awful lot of headlines from Van Gaal. Um, he's quite blunt. Um, it's it's a real dry sense of humour. I think that's what it is really. His it bluntness is. is direct. His direct way of speaking. Well. Um, Man United are probably alongside Arsenal one of the closest contenders to the title. Would you say it's fair? Would you would you think it's fair to say that it's City's title to lose now? Well, Mark, it's we're we're not even at Christmas at the moment. Um, not a lot of people tend to pay attention to the league table until the you know the New Year fixtures have come around and gone. Um, for me personally, I feel it's between United, sorry, City and Arsenal. Mm-hmm. I feel United haven't got enough consistency to their play at the moment to really mount a serious Premier League challenge. Um, so I can see if with Chelsea faltering away so drastically mm. the opening stages, I can see it coming down towards Arsenal and City. I mean, speaking of Chelsea right now, Alex, um, I would like to discuss with you about their Champions League uh, midweek win. And um, I mean, Mourinho, again, he's making all the headlines on and off the pitch. He's making all the headlines for the wrong reasons at the moment. Um, however, that the, the win in midweek was crucial for him. There were rumours circulating in the press, social media, depends if you believe social media. Um, that his time was coming to an end, that Chelsea, the board, were looking after the Stoke game to release some of his duties, which would give him or the incoming manager a good two weeks to come and assess the squad. Alex, he's, he's been in the press lately, and uh, you know, again, like I said, for a lot of reasons, and his run towards John Moss, um, and he quoted Arsene Wenger saying that Wenger was right about you when he said that you're a, a certain word, a bleep, uh, yeah. Yeah, a bleep uh, weak. Saying that he's, he's weak of character, basically, more or less. This is Marino to a T. Um, it's the kind of behaviour he's been demonstrating now for the last, well, for the last couple of months since Chelsea's, well, form, I would say it's dipped because it's been constantly poor since mm. the beginning of the season now. Um, again, it's Marino, as everyone knows, he's a passionate man. He vents his anger. 
Um, a lot of people think he's manipulated and calculated in the way that he goes about his business. For me, there are elements of his management style that do back that up. But for me, you know, what happens behind the tunnel shows that he's a very emotional man. Sometimes he, it's not always as calculated as we like to think. Let's switch over towards Arsenal now. You said they are the closest contenders to Manchester City's title. Now, Arsenal over the years have fallen away um, towards the last, towards the last, they say, 100 yards. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the Champions League uh, dreams are all but over, it's, it's fair to say. All but over, yes. Impossible, no. Um, stranger things have happened. If you look at the next couple of games now, if they go to the form book, Bayern Munich win in the next round and Arsenal do as well. Then it goes to Olympiacos um, away for Arsenal, and mm. Arsenal would need to win by two go- or by two clear goals, which is well within their own possibility. And I wouldn't put it past them. Arsenal. Well, let's see uh, how that unfolds with them. Uh, let's switch over towards the Europa League and uh, Jurgen uh, Klopp. <laughs> <laughs> Jurgen Klopp. Uh, I mean, I love the guy. He, uh, ever since he's come out, his, his smile's infectious. Uh, I think the way he speaks is just beautiful. He's articulate. Um, I'm just a big fan of individuals like that, uh, so don't worry too much about myself. But he picked up, um, he helped pick up Liverpool's first win in the Europa League. But um, interesting enough, Steven Gerrard has been linked back with a move in the off season of the MLS back to Liverpool. He has, and it, it depends which way you look at it, Mark. It's a double edged sword. Um, there's no doubt that a player, obviously, with, with Gerrard standing within Anfield, um, will be welcomed back with open arms. Um, there'll be a certain aura around the place with if he's when he joins in with the training, etc. However, Klopp's been explicit when saying that Steven Gerrard, there'll be no playing opportunities for him, which I think is best for the club. I mean, I would love to see Klopp and Gerrard work together. I mean, a lot of Liverpool fans would probably, wouldn't they? Yeah, of, co- of course they would. Of mm. course they would. Um, as you mentioned, Klopp's got an infectious demeanour about him. He carries mm. himself extremely well, apart from his last season at Dortmund, where he had a bit of a meltdown, but mm. who wouldn't when you you know, when you're lurking down the bottom of the Bundesliga. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, of course, you know, it would be the dream team for Liverpool fans at the moment. Staying in the Europa League and uh, across to Tottenham Hotspur, who won again and they continue their good recent form as of late. They'll beat Anderlecht by two goals to one. But it's a young English star that's making all the headlines, Alex. It is. It's, it's Deli Ali, And depending whether you think he's got enough quality, um, again, the press is full of rumours and speculation mm-hmm. that he'll be on the way to France 2016. Mm-hmm. He's made the provisional squad now for the upcoming friendlies against Italy, sorry, Spain and France. That's it. That's all right. I mean, Alex uh, Deli Ali again, he's one of many young, uh, talented uh, players from Tottenham that have come up from their, from their system. And uh, England, Tottenham just keep pro- providing these top English players. But unfortunately for Tottenham fans, they lose them to the bigger clubs. They do lose into bigger clubs, and well, I know Harry Kane's come through the ranks, but we know he's an Arsenal fan anyway. Um, of course, when you're a club as big as Spurs, um, which they are a big club, it's difficult to hold. The only thing at the moment is difficult to maintain and hold your top quality players mm. when you're not playing regular Champions League football. We've seen it with Gareth mm. Bale, we've seen it with Resley Schneider, or whether he was sold. Um, against I think wishes. you mean um, Van der Waart. Van der Waart, yeah. sorry, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> Schneider, I wish it. I, you oh, wish I just, it was, you wish I just it was Wesley Schneider. <laughs> I've just given away I'm a Tottenham fan. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I wish Wesley Schneider was at Tottenham alongside Van der Vaart. But yeah, it was Van der Vaart. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting point you said. I mean, but then I, 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 I beg to differ, Alex, because Tottenham don't pay a lot, they don't pay a lot for their players, uh, their salary wages. And regardless of whether, whether we're in the Champions League or not, players would eventually want to move on to bigger clubs where there's more opportunity to win trophies, play regular Champions League, at the same time build up their bank balance even more <laughs> than they would be at playing at Tottenham. Um, yeah. Let's switch over now to, uh, well, just mentions all the bigger clubs like Cristiano Ronaldo, Real Madrid's Cristiano Ronaldo and Portugal's. He's releasing a movie and it's coming out on, the, on November the 3rd. So before we go into that, let's have a look at the trailer. It was so much better than everybody. The astonishing Cristiano Ronaldo. Tell me who's the best player in the world. Me. <laughs> Until January. Winning. That's the most important to me. It's as simple as that. I apostei no meu filho para ir para Lisboa com 12 anos. Pensei que eu estava abandonado. Os meus irmãos a chorar, a minha mãe, mas que sabiam que era uma oportunidade que eu queria na vida. Não conheci realmente o meu pai. Um, dois, três, 
Epa. <laughs> the most important is friends and family. <laughs> I knew it, I was injured. But I needed to be here. My team needed me. He doesn't know what it means to lose. One of us looks for that. Nothing is impossible, my friend. I have what I have because I sacrifice a lot. To do good time. Some people hate me, some people love me. Fui feito para ser o melhor. Isso faz parte da minha maneira de viver a vida. Eu vou ser guarda-redes, pai, ok? Guarda-redes, estás a brincar, ok? Yeah, it does look fascinating, doesn't it? Cristiano Ronaldo in his first ever movie. Uh, what do you what do you make of that? Egotistical, Mark. Um, what are you expecting as well from it? From what I'm expecting, I'm looking well. I'm looking for an insight into more of his family life. Really, mm -hmm. I think everybody knows the exploits he's had as a player. I don't think anybody needs to see a movie reel. Mm -hmm. um, you can go on his YouTube, his greatest moments, and you'd be there for hours on end. Um, I think what a lot of people are expecting is to see, hopefully, a different side of Ronaldo. A family man, slightly more perhaps humble than he is in front of the main screens. Ronaldo's also, um, I think in the build-up to the movie, he was um, talking to one of the BBC reporters and he went on to say, in his mind, all he needs to know that he is the best player in the world. And if he doesn't think that way, then he won't perform at the, at the very best level that he's currently playing at. Regardless how many Ballon d'Ors or World Player of the Year Messi wins or anyone else wins. I mean, it just that just gives... Uh, more boost towards the league, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a psychological thing, I think, there, Mark. I mean, you look at, there's only two world-class players, in my opinion. And when you say world-class players, you're looking at players who are playing at a completely different level, and that, that's Messi and Ronaldo. Mm -hmm. um, players, not just in this generation, you look at slightly, you look at from the 70s, when you look at the greats such as Johan Cruyff, um, still has an ego now. Um, but you look at players, they need that ego to run off, they feed off that ego. And players like Ronaldo, then... No, he's not wrong in asserting himself as one of the world's best players, if not the world's best player. I'm sure Alex and Gareth Bale will beg to differ that there's only two best players in the world at the moment as we speak because he's half guided his side Wales to the European Championship next season, uh, next season, next year, in 2016 in France, alongside uh, three other home nations, England and Northern Ireland. Yeah, it's great news, as you mentioned there, Mark. There's the, well, the majority of the home nations, bar Scotland now, are looking forward to a summer in 2016 in France. It's a shame Scotland could have made it. It is a shame, but they were in a tough group. Um, yeah. Poland and Germany were arguably the favourites going into that group, but Scotland gave themselves a lot to do when they lost to mm -hmm. Georgia away. I mean, yeah, it's always difficult. I mean, when you see, um, I mean, from an emotional and sort of a point of view for myself, not to see all four of the home nations qualify, but at the end of the day, it's great to see more than just England going to be there next year. It is, Mark. And if I'm being completely honest with you, the team that I'm most looking forward to seeing play at Wales. Um, Apart from England's qualifying campaign, there's a weak, tepid group, um, which it seems to be getting quite a lot of easy draws yeah. uh, in qualifying campaigns of late. But go ahead. So I was going to ask you, why Wales in particular are you looking forward to? Um, there's a certain camaraderie when you look at that Wales team between them. They all look like they're playing for each other. Um, you can compare it, well, we'd say you can't compare it to England. There, there doesn't look to be any egos in there. You look at a man of the stature of Gareth Bale, and he still seems more, he seems, Wales seems to be his priority at the moment. Mm. And I, I like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, um, um, if you watched uh, last week's uh, uh, episode, the very first episode of uh, the post match show, uh, I was given the opportunity to attend the Asian Cricket Awards from the home of cricket, Lords. And it was quite an interesting event, and I um, and now I've been given the opportunity to actually attend the Asian Football Awards, which will take place on November the 19th from the home of football for its third instalment in four years. Alex? What do you know about the Asian Football Awards? And just tell me as well, um, how do you feel this awards has actually made a difference, the cricket and the football, to the Asian community as a whole? I think if you look at them, they're both being, well, they're both, both of the awards being, well, in their, in their respect for the sport, spiritual home. So for the Football Awards, it's being held from Wembley, which is a great privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really shows that the leaps and strides that Asian football has made. Mm -hmm. And equally for the cricket as well, being mm -hmm. held at Lords. I mean, it's an industry award that celebrates not only the 
current performing uh, international players or the club players, but also the, ne the, the next generation stars, as well as backroom staff, administrators, coaches, and some of the other unsung heroes. And um, so for me personally, I'm looking forward to the um, inspirational award uh, where, when that gets presented at the awards. For me, um, that, that will steal the show for me personally. Yeah, good on Mark. I know this is a subject close to your heart. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it's a night that really celebrates the grassroots upwards, as you mentioned, everybody from the tea ladies, really, uh, to the trainers. It's, it's going to be an excellent night. Well, make sure you tune in next week when we have more from the Asian Football Awards. Alex, can I just say it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> you mean it's a pleasure being on? <laughs> it's a pleasure being on. <laughs> yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure having uh, this young man and having his insights on the week. And, um, and when, we, when we tune in next week, I'm sure we'll have more from Alex. Um, as we look more from the post my show. For now, it's goodbye.